Thank you. And yeah, I got the uh, let's see, twenty twenty three. Yeah, they're gonna be all done by 2024, right? Yeah, they're kind of grass and stuff, probably. Yeah, right. Uh, since we're recording, does that mean we're at four or no? Double checking on one. Yes. Well, actually, we're opening the. Uh, so, so we're yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, there's there's no these that have to be done still are there. So the answer, yes, the answer is kind of yes all around. Right. Joe, we have quorum. You can go ahead. Thank you. Welcome everybody. We'll call this meeting to order. It's uh our policy committee meeting October 21st. Okay. Um item number two is vote on the approval of the agenda. Is there any discussion? In terms of protocols and all the stuff. Second by Bondurant, Marquita. Thank you. Let's get up. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention? Motion passes. Item number three is vote on the approval of the meeting minutes uh, from September 16th. Is there any comment or changes to that? Moved by the board. Is there a second? Moved. Second, Haddon. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Item number four is consent and vote on the approval of the financial statement. Todd, do you want to give us a brief on that? Yeah. The, the uh, financials were sent out with the packet reminder. Uh, pretty much our normal transactions. We had a couple large checks um, in September related to the transload um, facility reimbursements from the build grant. Um, other than that, uh, nothing out of the ordinary would recommend approval. Any discussion? Move to approve. Second, Reva. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, motion passes. Item number five, this is the part of the meeting where there's any public comment on the MPO actions. Is there anyone from the public on? I hear none, so we will move on to item six. It is a presentation from the Iowa Economic Development Authority's Clean Cities Coalition. And Allison. Yes, thank you. Uh, we've invited MK Anderson from the Clean Cities Coalition House of the IEDA um, to come talk about the program that they have available to communities throughout Iowa and obviously the Des Moines Metro. And so I believe MK has control. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see her screen and I'll hand it over to you, MK. Hold on one second. One second, Allison. All right, I think we got it up on the screen. Are you good, Gunner? I think so. All right, go ahead. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. So um, as Allison said, my name is MK Anderson. I am a project project manager with the Iowa Energy Office. And as part of that role, I run the Iowa Clean Cities Coalition. So today I'm here to talk to you about the Iowa Clean Cities Coalition, who we are, what we do, and how we can work with you. Okay, there we go. So the Iowa Clean Cities Coalition is part of a nationwide network of coalitions um, that work within their individual regions to reduce petroleum consumption. And we do that by promoting the use of alternative fuels, advanced vehicle technologies, and fuel reduction strategies. Each coalition is structured a little bit differently. 
Um, but in Iowa, it's housed within the Iowa Energy Office, which is housed within the larger Iowa Economic Development um, Authority. We became a coalition in 2009, and we cover the entire state of Iowa. Um, we're fuel agnostic, and we work with our stakeholders to find the right solution for them. And in 2020, our stakeholder activities reduced the equivalent of over 31.9 million gallons of gasoline. And then our work usually falls within education and consultations. So a few of our stakeholder projects include the city of Ames um, is in a partnership with the city of Des Moines and the Iowa DOT, and they are running 100% biodiesel in their dump trucks and their snow plows. Um, the Cedar Rapids School District is running both propane buses and electric buses on their routes. And then Ruan uses 20% biodiesel in all of their vehicles and has enacted idle reduction strategies as well as installed low rolling resistance tires on their vehicles. So we work with individual consumers, businesses, communities, commercial and agricultural fleets. Um, we work with them to promote alternative fuels, including ethanol, biodiesel, natural gas, propane, hydrogen, and electric. Um, fuel reduction strategies, such as idle reduction strategies, telematics, route optimization, um, energy efficient transportation systems, and alternative transportation. And uh, we do so by providing um, education in the form of presentations, publications, webinars, and events, as well as trainings. Um, we can provide fleet analysis and consultation, policy and program guidance, and we can serve as a connection between project partners. So we can provide education on alternative fuels, alternative fuel vehicles, advanced vehicle technologies, um, policies that can be enacted to support alternative fuel and alternative fuel vehicle adoption, as well as best practices that apply to your community's goals. Um, in the past, we've provided mechanic trainings, driver trainings, and first responder trainings, but we can also work with you to provide any kind of alternative fuel related training that you think might be necessary. And we work with fleets, um, and we can work with your fleet, as well as any of your constituents, um, to really take a holistic look at the fleet and um, determine the current footprint and total cost of ownership of that fleet, as well as what that would look like if alternative fuels were to be adopted or added into the fleet. Um, and when we do that, we also look at the simple payback and the return on investment of purchasing those alternative fuel vehicles. Um, we can work to identify funding opportunities and work with the fleet on applying to these funding opportunities. Um, and then we can provide technical assistance as the fleet rolls out any alternative fuel projects. And then we can work with communities to host listening sessions with your constituents to understand um, the appetite for and the barriers to adopting alternative fuels or fuel use reduction strategies in your area. Um, we can work with you on policy or program development to support alternative fuel um, adoption. We can provide project ideas and help with project implementation. And then again, we can also serve as a connection between project partners. Um, and that's what I have for you today. Are there any questions? Thank you, MK. Is there any questions? We appreciate the information. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. All right, we'll move on to item number seven is report and vote on the Federal Highway Administration and DOT Bill Grant Agreements. Todd? Yep, thank you. Wait for the screen to change over here. Yep. Essentially, uh, yeah, yeah, there we go. Um, essentially, uh, we we have two agreements left to approve. We approved agreements, the sub agreements last month with you know, the city, Polk County, uh, Central Iowa Water Trails. These are the, the agreements that actually pertain to the build grant and, and getting those funds um, uh, to the MPO for the, the construction contract. So there will be a contract between uh, the F. FHWA and uh, the DOT and the MPO, um, that agreement will lay out that Iowa DOT is the recipient of the build grant and the MPO in this case is considered a first tier uh, sub-recipient. Um, we've shared that um, agreement with the committee um, previously. Um, nothing's really changed in that agreement other than uh, the construction uh, dollar amount. Um, 
just to match where we are with the current estimate uh, during the plan turn in with the DOT, which happened um, earlier this month. And we changed um, some dates uh, to November 15th on that. Uh, so really nothing's changed in that document that you've seen previously. Uh, we would recommend approval of that document. Go to the next slide. The other agreement is an agreement between the DOT and the MPO. As I mentioned, we're a first tier subrecipient. So uh, we needed an agreement with the DOT. They'll, they'll receive the funds uh, from the build grant. We'll submit reimbursement requests to the DOT. They'll, they'll approve those and give us the reimbursement, then go to Federal Highway uh, to get reimbursed um, from Federal Highway for the, the expenditures on the construction contract. We're doing this um, in this way uh, because we wanted to use the DOT's already approved bidding and contract process. Um, and that's how it outlines uh, this the pieces that we have to do the uh, outlines the reimbursement process and uh, passes those recipient responsibilities that we discussed before onto the MPO. We're needing approval of those documents this month because we need to get them to the DOT early uh, next month as um, part of the bidding process and getting everything in the DOT system. I do want to note uh, we were contacted today uh, by Federal Highway. This doesn't impact these agreements any, but just can impact the, the process of the project. The current Transportation Act, the FAST Act, expired at the end of last month. We're under a, a, a continuing resolution that expires at the end of this month. Um, I'm, I anticipate they'll you know, do another extension uh, through November, uh, possibly through December to get past the holidays. But uh, Federal Highway just wanted to, to us to note that that could delay the bid letting in December, depending on how all that plays out. Uh, they aren't anticipating it right now, but they just wanted us to be aware that that's a possibility. It would back it up to January. Um, it wouldn't really have any impact on our anticipated construction schedule, but I uh, just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, at the end of the day, these two agreements, like I said, we, we recommend approval. Um, they just outline the process that we're going to be using for a reimbursement uh, for the build grant funds. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Todd. Any questions, Todd? Okay, Todd, All right. This is a voting item. Move. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Item number eight is report and vote, City of Carlisle, CDBG administration contract. Yes, thank you. Uh, so the City of Carlisle, next slide please, applied for a CDBG COVID grant a month or so ago for the Sprouts Early Learning Academy. It's a new daycare in their, the downtown. The $85,000 they applied for would be, be given to Sprouts to hire additional staff and, other, and cover other eligible items in the grant. As part of that grant application process, I, the Iowa Economic Development Authority recommends that grantees, aka the city of Carlisle, hire grant administrators who are knowledgeable in CDBG funding. The MPO has existing CDBG ex administration expertise and we have offered to administer the grant if awarded for a fee up to $5,000. The city of Carlisle has already approved the, the administration contract. Staff also recommends approval of the contract. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thanks, Andrew. Any questions for Andrew? This is our last voting item. Move approval, Haddon. Second. Second, Second Marquita. Oh. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention? Motion passes. Item number nine is report on the Joe, Joe, can, was yes. there an opposition to that from someone? Uh, was there an opposition for that? It wasn't me. I think it was just a late aye. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Just want to make sure. That would be a question for Scott. No, not right. Uh, item number nine is report only uh, on the office lease renewal. Todd, you're going to give us an update. 
Yeah, thank you. Our uh, lease is uh, up at the end of this year. Uh, we've worked with Nat Properties um, to update our our lease agreement. They're in the process of putting uh, the full agreement together, which we'd bring to you next month. Um, we also, at, during this process, looked at other properties. Um, their proposal for the, the renewal would be a, a contract that would have um, five years in the base and an option for two additional years. Uh, you can see the rates on your screen. The 1495 is lower than what we're currently paying by about 50 or 45 cents, I believe. Um, as I mentioned, option to terminate or renew at the five years includes some upgrades uh, to the office space. Also gives us the option um, to uh, first right of refusal to, to take the space at the end of uh, the hallway there, that empty space, provide some additional parking for the MPO as well at no additional cost. Um, go to the next slide, please. We did, this map shows um, some locations. I know it's gonna be hard to read and be happy. It was included in your packet, this report um, that Bill Wright uh, with Hubble uh, put together for us, um, but looked at other office spaces and, and um, really didn't have enough advantages of, of moving uh, to a different space. Um, either the rates weren't that any different or, or, or uh, a couple cases were more. Um, the parking issues weren't any better and uh, just a lot of reasons I would recommend staying in the space that we're currently in. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We'll bring the, the, um, the lease agreement to you next month for review. And approval. Thanks, Todd. Any uh, questions or comments for Todd about the lease renewal? All right, I hear none. Item number 10 is report on the Central Iowa Trail Roughness Condition Interaction Report from Z. Yes, uh, good afternoon. As you may know, the MPO collects annual trail roughness conditions on the regional trail network with the data bike, and we publish the data in print reports. Uh, but going forward, the MPO will now publish our collected data in an online interactive uh, map format. Uh, we think that this new format is hopefully more engaging and more accessible for everyone. Next slide. So I'll just briefly go through what this online interactive report looks like. Um, on your left-hand side, you have the menu where you can toggle between the different layers, the base maps, and um, additional information. You can um, look at different pavement imagery and trail roughness for the different years that we have collected data. Uh, once you zoom into a specific trail segment, you can click on the camera and it pulls up a pop-up of the trail pavement. And if you click on that photo, it gives you an enlarged image of that trail pavement. So if you have a moment, I would um, suggest you check out the interactive um, web application. If you have any questions on it, I'll be happy to take them. Any questions for Z? Uh, Joe, I, I just add that um, uh, Mayor Lorenz had asked at the, at the exec meeting if we could look at um, how we would do potentially a maintenance program on a regional level for, for bike um, ped issues. And so we'll start looking at that and bring it, bring some ideas back uh, at a future meeting. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Uh, on that website, is that, are those zeros or O's at the end of the, I think they're zero, but. Um, yeah, yeah they, they are zeros. We, we send links out after the meeting, so I'll be sure that this one's included. Uh, not sure if everybody heard me. Gunnar said they'll send the link out uh, for this particular, well, for all of them. And uh, so it'll be a lot easier to be able to, to get on it. So any other questions or comments? Item number 11 is reports on dark safety performance targets, targets uh, fiscal year 2022. Z. Yep. This one will be me. Uh, okay. Next slide, please. Yep. So as part of the Federal Transit Administration's Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, uh, transit agencies have to prepare safety plans and safety performance targets and work with the state and the MPOs during this process. So as, um, as part of this program, DOT has prepared uh, safety targets for FY 2022. Um, they up 
they have updated the targets, but the safety plan remains unchanged. The updated targets and performance are available in the um, image on your right hand side. Um, as part of this coordination, uh, we'll be uh, looking at these targets this month, and then we'll bring back uh, these targets to you next month. We have invited Pat Daly, the safety manager at DOT, uh, to come speak to us next month about these targets, and then we'll vote and approve them. Uh, afterwards, we'll incorporate these targets and performance into our MPO planning documents. If you have any questions on these targets, I can take them at this time. Thank you. Any questions? You're done. I'll move on to item 12 this report on the Iowa DOT 2018-2022 HSIP targets, highway safety improvement program. Z. Yep. Also me again. Yeah, so the Federal Highway Administration has the Highway Safety Improvement Program that requires state DOTs and MPOs to annually report safety performance measures. Uh, so MPOs could either support the state targets or develop their own targets. In the past, the MPO has been developing their own regional targets. Uh, but based on recent feedback from the executive committee, the MPO will now explore um, the adoption of the DOT targets, uh, but will still report on regional performance. So uh, the table on your right is the performance, uh, the statewide Iowa DOT performance for the 2018 to 2022 period. Uh, next slide. And uh, this table just gives you a, a look at the safety performance statewide and also on the MPO level. Uh, on top statewide, most of the safety performance is below um, what we saw last year. But in the MPO area, uh, safety performance has not been doing as well. Uh, we currently have exceeded the serious, the number of serious injuries, and uh, we're almost exceeding fatalities. And uh, we have met, we have seen similar levels of non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries. Um, so that's just something to watch out for as we end up the year. Um, again, we'll bring these targets to you for your vote and approval next month. Um, if you have any questions on these targets, I can take them at this time. Z, thank you. Any questions or comments? All right, item 13 is a report on the priority project solicitation for the annual DC trip. Zach? Yes, sorry, uh, mute button was sticking on me. Um, just want to give you a quick update on where we're at with the project solicitation for the annual DC trip. Um, as usual, this time of year, we are reaching out to the communities and asking them to update their priority project list. Um, we provide that list from last year to the technical committee at the beginning of the month, and we requested that they review that list, uh, make any changes to the existing projects, as well as um, add any new projects that they would like to see go on the priority list. And we ask that they return that list for those uh, updates to us by December 16th. Um, so once we get those updates back, we'll um, update the list and then we'll provide you with an update in January of what the uh, new priority projects are uh, for the next trip to DC, which we are anticipating will be back on its regular, regular schedule in May. Um, at least that's how we're going to operate until we uh, hear otherwise. Um, if you have any questions about the process, I'd be happy to take them at this time. I appreciate the comments. Did anyone have any comments or questions for him? Item 14 is report for renewal of Cook County Watershed Management MOU. Allison. Yes, thank you. Each year we bring back the MOU between Polk County and the MPO um, for renewal. Um, just a reminder of some of the MPO duties. So we help administer the actual WMA meetings themselves, taking the minutes and organizing the public meeting records. Um, we help with mapping support as well as planning policy development and then outreach and communication like things like um, the rain campaign. So one of the things when John Swanson and I were discussing um, the update this year is that we'd like to make this a perpetual agreement with the option to withdraw in March of each year. Um, we would keep the funding the same um, and actually outlined in the document the months that we would um, produce the invoices to the county. Um, that draft MOU was reviewed by MPO Council and sent to 
um, Polk County Council last week. So um, we'll be bringing this back to you in November, but I did just wanna make you aware of some of these changes and I'd be happy to take any questions you have about it at this time. Thanks, Allison. Any questions, comments? Okay, item 15 is a report on the ICLEI Regional Affiliate Membership. Allison. Yep. So ICLEI actually stands for ICLE. Um, and so climate action planning is on the rise across the metro and throughout the state, as well as federally. Um, Des Moines, Urbandale, Johnson, Polk County are all taking steps on their own um, with their citizens. Um, and within their staffs. Um, and federally, just a couple of weeks ago, 20 plus federal agencies released their climate adaptation and resilience plans, including the US DOT, HUD, and Homeland Security, which are three agencies that the MPO really keeps an eye on what's going on there. Next slide. So with that, we wanted to um, explore ideas of how we can help um, our member communities kind of manage this process and enable them to make steps in whatever direction they choose. Um, and one of those options is ICLE. Um, it's got a longer title, but they go by local, uh, local governments for sustainability. And really it's just a network of local governments devoted to solving some of these sustainability challenges. Um, they do have three traditional membership pathways. There is a city, county, and tribal pathway that any city, county, or tribal group could join. A regional affiliate would focus on um, organizations like the MPO um, and things like that. And then there are educational institutions as well. Um, it should be noted that UNI um, is an educational institution and typically they carry out a lot of the work um, across the state really um, when it comes to ICLE. Some of the benefits of a regional membership are similar to those as a city. Um, we get some of the frameworks for policy and action. Um, it's not dictating anything that a city needs to do, but really provides a roadmap for whatever your city kind of decides for their suite. Um, it also provides tools. So ClearPath is the main one that um, we'd be utilizing first, and that really helps to formalize and organize um, greenhouse, greenhouse gas emission reports. Um, it would also provide technical assistance to the region and member communities. Um, we can work as a cohort and kind of think about how we want to move these things forward and then network with other regions and communi communities across the country and really globally and compare and contrast what we're doing together so we can kind of find what um, works for each of our individual communities. Next slide. So there is an annual membership fee for this. Um, so if each individual community wanted to become a membership on their own, you can see here populations below or below 100,000 people is about $1,200. And then the sweet spot between 100,000 and 300,000 is 2250. Um, if we became a regional member, it is based on our operating budget at the MPO. And so that would put us in at the $3,400 level annually. Um, so really a pretty, good bang for the buck um, across the region. Uh, like I said, UNI is already a member. So is the city of Des Moines. Actually, Mayor Frank County is the part of the executive leadership for the, the, uh, for the organization. And Des Moines status as a member, if the MPO um, also became a regional affiliate, would not be affected. Actually, it would probably bolster our, our work in the um, metro. Additionally, if if while we do this, um, other cities decide that they also want to have a membership and have one-on-one -on -one technical training, um, they can also join as well, and that wouldn't affect any sort of regional membership either. Next slide. So through this, we could, um, like monthly performance reports, we could actually conduct the greenhouse gas inventories for our member jurisdictions um, through the Clear Path tool. That would include training for myself as well as other MPO staff, um, and we would work with the communities to provide custom, te custom technical resources and trainings through our technical advisors at ICLE. Um, both of these climate action plans are not required for any city. Um, some cities are deciding to put these climate pieces into their comprehensive plan or working into the hazard mitigation plans. Um, and this would just really encourage that no matter how we integrate these things into our planning processes, that we have kind of the same baseline um, data like our greenhouse gas inventories. Um, and so creating that cohesiveness. Additionally, if there are member communities that are thinking about doing this in the future, um, we can, doing it as a consortium here, we can save up 15,000 annually on individual fees for communities. So I wanted to bring this all to you as an opportunity um, and I would be happy to take any questions that anyone has about the membership or the work um, at this time. So Allison, if, if, 
CMPO will join this, then member communities can pick and choose what resources they wanted to tap into for this organization. So the MPO could help put together those resources. So we at the MPO would actually be managing the like the tool that I was talking about, the clear path system. So just because it is a large database, we would house it at the MPO and then provide that to the cities. And then based on that, um, the cities can decide, hey, we want to focus on whether it's EVs or you know energy efficiency in homes. We can bring in that technical advisor to help walk member jurisdictions through that. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks, Allison. Any other questions for Allison? Comments? Yeah, I actually maybe a mayor could answer this one. So why would Des Moines continue to be an individual member if they could come under the MPO umbrella? That would definitely change the level of, uh, of membership because you saw it was up to 300,000 for that number. Uh, throw Des Moines in there, that would push over 500,000 and be a totally different number. Plus, uh, we have a direct affiliation uh, with ICLEI on a management, regional, national, international basis uh, that allows us um, not only all the technical advice that's uh, here, but also in the management and trying to uh, uh, be part of the voice to increase, and this is Des Moines' voice, uh, you know, the local government uh, interaction and raise voices of subnational to team with all levels of government uh, up to heads of state level to raise the awareness. We're seeing increased extreme events around here, um, and I think there are help. Uh, this, this helps a lot of jurisdictions come together that are of a certain size that are able to uh, team together and get uh, advice sure. at this level. We're, we're at a much different level. So then Des Moines would continue its membership at the current level? I would hope so. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we wouldn't pressure Des Moines to remove themselves from any sort of membership. And honestly, they're quite a bit further along than a lot of our other member communities. So we'd like to keep that momentum going. And so I'd enc encourage that membership to continue. Thanks, Allison. Is there any other questions or comments? All right, item number 16 is a report on the Purple Heart Highway update from Todd. Thank you. Um, earlier this month, uh, Joe and, and Matt uh, met with uh, Director Marler at the DOT to uh, discuss kind of where we're at with things. Uh, one of the things that uh, we talked about last month was they were uh, preparing to meet with different stakeholders. Uh, the list on the screen is the list of stakeholders they're proposing to meet with. The ones in bold are the, the entities that they have already met with. Uh, they will be scheduling meetings um, through the rest of this, what's left of this month and into November uh, with, um, you know, Farm Bureau Partnership, um, the communities along the corridor, um, and et cetera. So they're having those discussions ongoing. Uh, next slide. Uh, a lot of text here, but essentially um, at the meeting, and Joe and Matt can offer comments here as well. Um, but at the, at the meeting, they talked about how um, not having the interstate does uh, hamper economic development opportunities along the corridor and how that impacts, you know, site selectors and, uh, you know, the federal issues with, with weight and limits on interstates um, in Iowa in particular um, is, a, is an issue that they've been uh, trying to deal with uh, for quite some time. Uh, the main way to get around that is to put uh, 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 something in the language of a new transportation bill. Um, that's how other states have, have gotten around that. So uh, Joe or Matt, I don't know if you'd like to add anything else. Sure. Uh, go ahead, Matt, if you want. I, and then I can jump in after. Uh, sure. Well, it, I think it was a productive meeting and ultimately what they're trying to do is get the stakeholders involved at the, you know, one on one level so that they can have conversations and not, you know, have everybody in a large group and try to try to deal with this by committee. 
and then ultimately start dealing with the changes I felt that their offer to the uh, to to reach out to Iowa State and Iowa with a, a comprehensive plan for safety improvements as it relates to transmitters and other other types of devices is underway and they're they're following up on those meetings and uh, I really feel like that you know we're making progress and this is going to be you know a series of steps that we're going to have to go through and it isn't going to be a fast process but at least it uh, it isn't going to leave people wondering uh, if they had input or if this decision was made by you know a small group and forced down their throats I think that it will come through consensus and working together as a group. Yeah, great comments. I re reiterate that. Also, um, one thing that came out of the meeting, and I spoke with Ruth briefly before the, our meeting started here, was uh, certified uh, certified lots or part partials of, of ground for economic development through the state. And uh, they asked uh, Matt and I about that, and I think that we're working through the partnership. But as as uh, you know, I contacted our city staff. Uh, we don't have any um, on this, at least the southeast side. Now there might be a there might be something a uh, little that's that's not zoned correctly, so it's not shovel ready. So it. If any of the other member communities that, that are listening, that are on the corridor, that have that, um, we would like to know that and, and where exactly it would be, um, so we can pass that on to uh, to them. But that that is very important for economic development, so we can show that we're shovel ready, along with trying to redesignate this um, to an interstate. If that was something, you know, they were encouraged. It was it was good conversation. I mean, I, I think that uh, we're, we're moving this in the right direction. But as Matt said, this isn't something that's going to happen overnight. I know we've been trying this for years, but I think that the, the path that we're on now uh, is much better than any other path that we've taken so far. Is there any other comments or questions for Matt or I uh, about any other discussion? All right, Todd, thank you for your update. We'll move on to item 17. It's a report on the Economic Development District update from Gunner. Good afternoon, everyone. As you know, we've been moving through a process toward the creation of an Economic Development District for Central Iowa. Uh, and we are done with phase one, done with phase two now, and we're in the phase three, which is the hurry up and wait phase. Uh, we have submitted all necessary materials to the EDA for consideration of that designation, uh, including the SEDS that was completed. Uh, this fall, as well as uh, several materials they've asked for about the district. Uh, we've had some back and forth uh, with EDA staff. Uh, they've asked for some follow-up information and that has been provided to them. Uh, so we continue in the uh, waiting phase. Uh, the last thing I'll note before giving up the floor is that the work that has been done today is already having value of note that there are multiple jurisdictions uh, seeking uh, grant funding, we, uh, we believe, through the American Rescue Plan, um, and that ISU and NTMEC are also putting applications, and all of these are going to benefit by the creation of the SEDS document, uh, but they'll be able to effectively check a box and tell the EDA uh, that these do fall under regional priorities. So that's it for me, unless I can answer any questions. Governor, thank you. Any questions? And number 18 is report on the transload facility updates. Zach. Yes, thank you. Uh, Des Moines Industrial is making a lot of good headway on the development of the facility. So we can switch to the next slide, please. Um, this following bullets on the screen here kind of give you an idea of what uh, they've been working on and wrapping up this month. Um, for example, they've been uh, pouring uh, the warehouse slab and uh, finishing up work on that. Um, I think I've mentioned before, but they're using a really unique technology on this warehouse slab that uh, allows them to still pour a four inch uh, slab rather than an eight inch slab. And there's some uh, steel fibers in there that allow them to do that. It's really innovative technology. It doesn't have any uh, uh, grooves that they have to, to put in it. So it's it, a really uh, slick technology that allows them to have a really nice product at the end of the day. 
for their warehouse floor. Uh, Railworks is completing up the track installation. Um, I'll show you some pictures of that here in a minute, but they're uh, scheduled to have that done by the end of this month. Uh, the roof was 90% complete about two weeks ago, so I'm guessing that now the roof is 100% complete. Um, they also installed a truck scale on site last week, which will allow them to do um, some things there on the site that they wouldn't be able to do if they didn't have that scale. Um, the office walls and the electric are almost all completed, and they've also started um, hiring some positions. So they have hired um, an operations manager, and they have a posting out for a business manager. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so here are some images to show you of the track being constructed. Um, so this is kind of on the west side of the facility there, uh, looking east towards the, the warehouse um, where they connected into the old track. Next slide. Um, this is a this picture kind of pulls back out a little bit more and shows you a little bit more of that track that they're installing. Um, you can see that they've pretty much got all of that uh, track put in at this point. Um, this image just shows you the workers on site putting the track in. Uh, you know, Gabe was telling me a story about this, and the the fun thing about it, he said, is that you know they, you know, with all the technology we have and machinery we have, machinery we have, um, they still drive the spikes in uh, by hand. He said watching these guys work is just amazing. Um, you know, basically they put the spike in with one stroke, and he said it's a lot of fun to to watch them uh, lay the track down. Uh, this image shows them pouring the uh, pavement out in front of the warehouse facility. This is another image of them uh, putting that pavement down um, out in front of the facility. And then this image here uh, gives you kind of a good look at what the site looks like today. They've done a lot of work on the stormwater facilities there, which is what you can see um, here in the front of the picture. Uh, as well as just the groundwork and the, the concrete poured back there on the uh, gives you a good idea of what the facility looks like if you were to drive by it today. And uh, then just to give you a quick update on where we're at as far as reimbursements go, uh, we submitted their fourth reimburse, reimbursement request um, on October 20th. It was for a little over $1.4 million. Um, that uh, payment was approved today, so we anticipate that um, FRA will be uh, sending a check to us here in the next day or so, and we can turn that around, get that back to uh, Des Moines Industrial probably sometime next week. Um, to date, a little over $7 million in federal funds have been reimbursed, and uh, that includes the $1.4 million that we submitted on the 20th, and then we got um, a little over $4.1 million in federal funds remaining to be reimbursed for. Um, you know, in talking to Gabe, I think we'll probably in the next couple of reimbursement requests, we'll probably um, eat through those remaining federal funds. So well on our way to uh, using up the federal funds and towards having the project completed. Uh, the next slide here just gives you an example of kind of where we're at as far as schedule goes. As I mentioned, the rail work is scheduled to be completed by the end of October. Um, they're anticipating that based on that, the actual rail portion of the site will be operational in November. Um, the warehouse, there's still some work to do on the inside of the facility there, and they're anticipating that, that won't be completed and operational until uh, early February of next year. Um, and then the close out of the project will be in March. The one thing they are having to wait for is their formal certificate of occupancy. Um, that won't happen until the spring. The reason for that is um, for them to get that from the city of Des Moines, they have to have all their landscaping done. Now is not the greatest time, winter with winter coming to put in landscaping. So they'll have to wait till uh, the spring to get that landscaping in. And once they do that, they'll be able to get that formal, formal certificate. Um, but that's the basic schedule moving forward. Um, they're you know, on time and on budget right now. Uh, the weather has really cooperated and we're all really excited to see um, this project uh, finally coming to fruition after all the, the years we've worked on it. So. Uh, that's where we're at with the Transit facility. I'd be happy to take any questions you have. Zach, thanks for the update. Any questions? We're getting there. Item 19 is a report on the legislative update from Dylan. 
Thank you. We've got two updates for you here. The first one is just an update on the on the federal side with reauthorization and reconciliation. As you've probably seen in the news, there's still no deal yet. Um, there's work being done to try to cut down the proposed bill from 3.5 trillion to something closer to 2 trillion. Um, I read an article just a bit ago, and I'll put this in the chat that gives a, uh, an update as of a couple hours ago of where they're at with that and what they're attempting to do. Sounds like they want to have something done, hopefully negotiation wise, by the end of the week, but yet to be seen whether that actually happens. As Todd mentioned earlier, there was a 30 day continuing resolution to the existing FAST Act. So it's likely we might see another continuing resolution if something doesn't happen in the next week or two. Um, on to the next item, just in case you hadn't seen today, the second um, redistricting maps were released. Of note for the MPO is that Warren County would be pushed into District 1 um, instead of District 3, where everything in the MPO currently is. So something to keep in mind, there will be a special session on a week from today where they will be able to vote this up or down. And if it does not pass, then we'll have another, another proposed plan to look at sometime down the road. That's what I have for you. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thanks, any questions for Dylan? All right, item 20 is report on upcoming events, Governor. A couple of public meetings to make you aware of with regards to the US 69 Public County. Some of the in-person options have already occurred, but there are virtual options that are still open through October 25th. This first here is to a larger stretch of highway 69 from County Line Road in Des Moines on up to I-80 in Polk County. These links will be included in our post meeting email. Similarly, uh, this is about a section up in Ankeny. However, um, again, the in-person meeting has passed the self-paced version. is still open virtually through the 25th. Speaking of the online platform, for the virtual meetings, I want to point out this new tool uh, called Reach, or Real-Time Engagement Communications Hub. Uh, you do need to create an account on there. It's pretty easy to do. I did it myself. Uh, and then you can use that to navigate to different virtual opportunities. Did want to mention the Ice Storm Conference one more time coming up later this month. It is being held virtually again, and there is a session just for local leaders if you're interested. And lastly, there's an electric vehicle readiness webinar being put together for communities coming up on November 10th. Um, it's being held by Zoom House, and our staff has been helping with the plan for this. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to her. And with that, I take any more questions. Thanks, Governor. Any questions? Comments? Thank you. Uh, item 21 is other non action items of interest to the committee. Todd, do you have anything? I just have a real quick one. Um, last month we mentioned that uh, um, Shiroshi was leaving the MPO and moving on to the city of Des Moines. Uh, we did um, work on finding a replacement for her and, and uh, we have selected Aspen Flans uh, to join the MPO staff. Aspen was a, an intern for us uh, previously and, and uh, currently or uh, I think she's stopped now but uh, worked at the DOT uh, for the past year or so. Uh, so she will be joining us um, starting next week. Anyone else have anything? All right, our next meeting date is November 18th at four o'clock. And if no one else has anything, this meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.